Well, that was a trip to Dick Kick City, but you know what? It's just one road game all the same. What's up, guys? It's DDP, and this Mavericks game, not not a great one to watch. This is one where, while the defense was pretty good for Dallas through the first half, the offense never clicked into gear tonight, and the red flags were there pretty early on. Uh, seven minutes into the game, you have Tim Hardaway Jr. leave with a hamstring injury. It is unclear. He did not return. It's unclear how long he'll be out. What a world where we're listing a Tim Hardaway Jr. injury as a significant uh, disadvantage for this team to have to deal with. All the same, yeah, he, he pulls his hamstring. He intercepts a pass, gets a fast break dunk, but as he's like cutting to come back up court, starts pulling at his left hamstring a little bit gritted it out barely through the rest of the next Lakers possession before coming out of the game. Uh, not clear yet what the word is on him. Luka a little bit slow going as well. He got he got a couple baskets late, but really for Luka, the big, the big scare of the night came with about two minutes left in the first half. He was basically drove the lane, drew a crowd as he always does. There was LeBron there, there was Dwight Howard there, and I want to say uh, KCP, Caldwell Pope was there as well, and on the play, basically, Luca's trying to throw a skip pass, but as he's trying to throw the pass, he's kind of drifting forward. Dwight trying to block the pass or shot, he doesn't know what it is. It's not a dirty play, to be clear. It's a very physical play, it's a scary fall, but there's no malintent in that play. Uh, Dwight hits him up high, ball pops away from Luca. Luca crashes down hard on the floor on his lower back. What really scared me about the play, though, the back, yeah, that that's obviously bad news. I mean, I, I can speak from a personal experience on back injuries, but you add in the whiplash effect of his head. I don't know if his head at the court, but at the very least, the whiplash is a scary thing in, in its own right. I mean, just whiplash by itself, not even hitting the court, can still result in a concussion. I mean, literally, it's like throwing your bl your brain in a blender and like whoosh, whipping it back. So even if your head doesn't strike the court, there's still some serious damage that could be done there. To be clear, we didn't have the glassy-eyed Luca thing we had at one point previously. I think that was early this year, or was that last year? I think that was this year. That memory feels so distant now. But we didn't have a mem we didn't have a moment like that, thankfully. Nothing with Luca seemed like it was an issue in terms of a concussion sign, so that's good. But it definitely affected him the rest of the game. Now he ends up with 19, 7, and 4. But, you know, like I said, he gets a couple baskets late that really don't have a huge impact on the game. And as a result of that, yeah, 5 of 14 from the field, 0 of 6 from 3. He did go 9 of 9 at the line, including making the two free throws at the line after the Dwight Howard foul before then going to the locker room to get checked out. He comes back and would return. But this was a, this was an uncharacteristic game from Luka. And even before the injury, it wasn't quite his usual performance. He had six turnovers in the game, and you had a stretch there in the late third quarter with like a minute left where it was turnover Luka, turnover Luka, near turnover Luka. Like you, you saw it kind of taking shape where you're like, oh, okay, okay, it's not working right now. Uh, I don't know if he's gassed and just making bad plays, if he's just out of sorts and whatever, physically limited. I don't know, but it's clearly hampering him, and they need to do something because this is not this is not going to work. Now, to my surprise, they sent him back in with about four minutes left in the game, even though the game had pretty much stayed in about that 15 to 17 point range. Dallas never got over the hump. Defensively, they could not get the stops they needed. The Lakers didn't even have to have a big night out of LeBron. Now, he... He controlled the game in terms of his assists. I think he had, I have 13 assists down. He might have had more than that. No, nope, 13 assists. 13, so that's wrong. It's 13 points, 13 assists for LeBron and uh, six boards. So, yeah, I'll update that real quick. But, yeah, LeBron controlled this game. Anthony Davis got anything and everything he wanted right at the rim. Basically just beating Dallas down the court, LeBron throwing full court passes to him for easy dunks, easy layups, and they didn't have much of a much difficulty. The Lakers guarding the rim tonight was insane. JaVale McGee, three blocks, 16 minutes, 11 points, five rebounds for JaVale McGee, JaVale McGee on five of six shooting. You then got Anthony Davis adding in a block. You don't get a block. No, you do get one block out of Dwight Howard as well. The Lakers with that three-headed monster, even though Dwight Howard, he's been much better this year. He's calling back a lot more to his prime Dwight Howard years. 
but it is it is an interesting three-headed monster of rim protection you have there and it's something that's going to be formidable if they if they play up to their potential I still look at this as this way. This is the first time I felt like the Lakers really beat Dallas. I know they're two and one against us on the year now, but the first one we got gypped with a blown call on the overtime forcing shot by Danny Green. Uh, that was the Luca game, wasn't it? That was the Luca game. He was a little bit glassy there. Uh, then you had us going into LA and knocking the tar out of them. And in this game, yeah, the Lakers, until their last game, they were on the second night of a back-to-back, just like we were. Uh, LeBron and Anthony Davis played like 36 and 37 minutes, respectively. Their game was later in the day than ours was yesterday. And uh, they had a longer travel back to the Staples Center than we did. So maybe, just maybe, it allowed for somewhat of a, an advantage for Dallas there. Dallas 2-1 and one on the season coming into... Uh, the second night of a back-to-back in Dallas in those games was averaging about 129 points. So we, we've been good. Not only are we road warriors, although we obviously lose this game 12 and four now on the road, not only are we road warriors in that regard, but we're, we've been good in those situations. And in this game, it just, it wasn't there. It wasn't there. Credit to the Lakers and their defense. They they threw the kitchen sink at us, it felt like, in terms of pressure. They had all of our role players uncomfortable in making mistakes. Obviously, you have then the Hardaway Jr., your basically third man, go out, and you lose him very early in the game. You have KP start hot, but then kind of fade. And we've we've seen KP really struggle against the Lakers. This is another ho-hum night for him. 11 points, 7 boards. I want to say he had five quick points in this game. I want to say he had Dallas's first five points. And, you know, he hits another one of those logo three-pointers, this time not against the buzzer beater. But, you know, it is what it is. Like, KP has had his struggles. And four of ten shooting for him, three of seven from three. He had a block and a steal. So not a terrible game, but in terms of what you need him to be, especially in a game where you've already lost your number three guy, you needed more out of him. Speaking of role players, I mentioned they struggled as well with the defense. DeLon Wright had himself a very nice game. I have him on here as well. Uh, 14 points, four boards, three assists for DeLon Wright. Five of nine from the field, one of two from three, three of three at the line, three steals. DeLon Wright, I feel, was pretty solid for Dallas in this game. I think part of what I think part of what hurt Dallas in this case was they just couldn't get enough of their role players stepping up. Like Luca was struggling, KP was struggling, and Dallas could hang around, but they couldn't get over the hump. They could never really cut it down. They got to within nine a couple times, but they could never get really into that proper striking distance. And, you know, calls were calls were kind of crappy, to to be honest. Like, I'm not I'm not a fan of complaining about the refs because I feel like, you know, you, you deal with what you can control, which you can improve upon. You can't really do a whole lot in that regard. It's not like Luca was belligerent with the ref and then the ref never gave him a call the rest of the game. I would argue in that case, hey, maybe don't do that. Maybe just, you know, put your head down, go to the next play and, you know, let it take care of itself. That wasn't the case here. This was just you're in L.A., which is the Lakers and their aura and they're the best team in the Western Conference right now. They were on a four-game skid before last night, beating Portland. And yeah, they they look they look good. They look good. But I still feel like we can go toe to toe with them. I feel like Dallas can still push them in a series. And you know, we'll see what ends up happening in that regard. But you got to get more play. You got to get better play out of your team than Dallas got here because. You didn't get much out of anyone else. Dorian Finney-Smith, a nice game here for him as well. 12 points, 6 boards, 3 assists, 4 of 8 shooting, including 3 of 5 from 3. Yo, Dodo, just like I had to eat some crow, so to speak, with Tim Hardaway Jr., I'm eating all the crow in the world about Dorian Finney-Smith because that dude has stepped up this year. I knew what he could do defensively. I knew what he can do in terms of rim slashing and put-back dunks and all of that. I never was a believer in him as a 3 and D option, a viable piece of significance to this team, unless he could fix that three-point shot. And the best up mark of his career was last year at just a tick over 30%. Dude shooting like, you know, going into this game, and he's 3 of 5 here. 
he he's shooting like 36 percent from three like 36 37 almost percent like it's it's a marked market improvement in his three-point shooting compared to the rest of his career and give credit to rick carlisle for that man like we we talk about hey the mavs with their fallen angels i, I did a post on this earlier the mavericks with their fallen angels that even before carlisle they were always pretty good in the cuban era of finding these guys who had kind of lost their way a little bit you know these guys who came in and they were players of note dropped off a bit dallas scoops them up on a cheap contract and then through good coaching and a good system good culture all of that they're able to get a lot more out of them help them raise their game back up to a higher level guys like that are like your jerry Stackhouses, your monte ellis's and when i when i talk about these guys specifically i'm talking about guys who they raise their game here and then even after they left here they they didn't really recapture that magic which kind of showed it was the coaching here and it was the system and everything like that not not saying that, but Tim Hardaway Jr. looks to be the latest example of that. Dorian Finney-Smith doesn't really fit because obviously he was an undrafted free agent that came here. So that's not exactly there. But what I wanted to lump him in on for that point was more so to talk about Rick Carlisle and his player development. Because a lot of people want to say, who has Carlisle really developed on this team? And no, you can't say Luka. Uh, he's partially responsible for improvements in Luka's game from the time he came over to the team you can't just take none like take all of that from him but how he's been able to turn tim hardaway jr into a pretty respectable third option on this team is pretty damn impressive uh best year of his career that he's had even though it was a very slow start he was able to help him specifically with the mechanics of his shot work through some very bad early season struggles and since then tim hardaway jr has been one of our better players for the most part Dorian Finney-Smith, his growth and evolution, substantial this year. And it's not just that he's getting the open looks because he was getting those open looks last year too when he was still playing with Luka. And it wasn't it wasn't translating to a lot of made threes. So guys like that, you got to give those examples. Uh, other fallen angels, just real quick, you could throw in your guys like Vince Carter, or Richard Jefferson, uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys like that. You could throw in a number of guys and maybe that's a list for some time. Um, for me to do on the channel but for now let's just stay focused on this game this is uh this is a game where without getting that help across the bench you you were going to be pretty much in for a hurting because the best performance you got off the bench was delon wright's 14 and that's great brea gave you 12 i actually i i really debated putting brea on the board over kp here and the only reason i didn't is because with KP and Luka, they're kind of like the assumed players that you put up there if they played in the game because they're your two premier guys. Like, those are the first... When people ask whether they didn't see the game or not, when they ask, hey, how did the Mavericks do? The first things they're going to look at in the box score are going to be Luka and KP. So that kind of hamstrings you a little bit. Now, yeah, Berea, 13 minutes, 12 points, 4 of 7 shooting, 2 of 3 from 3. Uh, Berea, man, he's... He's still instant offense off the bench. And, you know, I, I understand people who want to see more of Brea, but I really do think that he has some degree of minutes restriction where between his age and what he's coming off of in terms of an injury, he can give you these short bursts every now and then. But if you start playing him heavy minutes as if he's a standard heavy, you know, con uh, contributor every night, I think you're going to really burn him out way before you get to the playoffs. And this is the kind of weapon you want to keep sheathed for that rainy day when you really need it and that's why i think rick has tried to be more strategic about it and brea's kind of expressed you know some of uh his ultimate task his ultimate challenge here uh in terms of his underdog tail trying to come back from this injury and round back into form and prove that he can still do it night in night out that's the perfect mentality i love that and i, I think brea He's a consummate pro anyway, and how long he's been with Dallas and with Rick specifically, I think there's that healthy level of respect and understanding and trust between them that he knows Rick is doing what is best for him and the team ultimately, uh, and that it will pay off, and JJ will have his opportunity to really prove himself like he wants to. But yeah, you got a couple guys like that helping you. Seth Curry, man. Usually, if it's not Tim Hardaway Jr. stepping up, it has to be Seth Curry. Uh, ghost. Go seven points, one board, three of 11 shooting, one of three from three. He did have a steal, but 
you know, before the last game, the last two games prior to this, he was shooting like 0 of 8 in those two games. And he's got to, he's got to figure something out, man. He's right, right as I start talking you up again and like, like, okay, you guys owe an apology. You owe Seth Curry an apology and you owe Seth Curry an apology. He goes back to laying goose eggs or very eh, underwhelming production. And it kind of makes me feel like I'm the asshole, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, they got to get better than that. Speaking of having to be better than that, my dude, Justin Jackson has fallen off a cliff. 21 minutes, two points, three boards, one assist, one of six from the field. Oh, a four from three. He, he was getting defensively. He looked like he was getting used and abused a bit. Uh, minus six for the game for him. That's, I mean, in terms of bench minutes, he was the second most bench minutes behind Seth Curry. So when you got the two of them combining for nine points on, what, four of 17 shooting, you're going to be in a bad way. And that's just how, that's just kind of the, the way this game went. Dallas was not able to get anything under control, even through the first half. I mean, they were shooting like 33%. They end up 36% for the game compared to 49% for the Lakers. 30% from beyond the arc. They did knock down 13-3, so that does snap whatever streak uh, they were talking about where it was like a franchise record for most consecutive games with 14 made threes, uh, at least 14 made threes. The Rockets hold the NBA record at 23 games. I believe the Mavericks have gotten to like 14, I want to say. Uh, that streak snaps tonight as they make 13. The Lakers, 9 of 23 from 3. Free throws, Dallas 18 of 20 at the line, but the Lakers got there more. And again, I said some of these fouls sucked. I felt like Dallas was, there was clear contact and Dallas wasn't getting it, whether it should have been and ones or whatever. But, you know, to, to be fair, there were times Dallas was getting fouled, but they were just missing the and one. Like Luca or Dwight Powell would get fouled going to the basket and like they'd finger roll up, it would back iron and come out. And you're like, ooh, that should have been an easy and one. And now that's an extra point that we're hurting and missing. In Dwight Powell's case, he missed one of the free throws then. And you're like, huh, okay, that, that really kills us now mistakes like that i don't think it was a season high for turnovers in dallas for dallas but 18 is way uncharacteristic for them uh the lakers had 16 turnovers 17 assists for dallas uh compared to 28 for the lakers they did out rebound la surprisingly 45 to 39 including 13 offensive boards in the first quarter dwight powell was swallowing up rebounds offensive rebounds left and right and that's what was keeping Dallas in it early on, I think, was the rebounds and all of that. But the second chance points started to tilt away from us despite the boards. The points off turnovers went way against us. The points in the paint, L.A. more than doubled us up. The, the last time I saw that at the end of the third quarter, it was like 48-24 L.A. They, they were just getting everything they wanted in the paint. And it's, it's the issues we've talked about. Interior defense, while KP has been great this year, he's been a fantastic defensive presence for us you do see these teams that attack us they attack Dwight they attack even to a lesser extent uh Maxi and they they impose their will and that's just that's what happened here LA got everything they wanted got all the high percentage shots got the benefit of some calls but for the most part I don't think it would have mattered on a night like this because Dallas wasn't doing much of anything offensively I mean shit 95 points we're talking about a team that had been averaging 115 points per 100 possessions. Like, all-time most efficient offense ever. And here you go. Lakers threw some real defense at us, and you got to give them credit for it. But at the end of the day, Dallas just wasn't hitting their shots. It was just kind of one of those games. Uh, I mentioned earlier how LeBron was able to... He nearly gets a triple-double. 13, 13, and 6. Anthony Davis had the easiest 23 and 8 game I think I've seen out of him in a long time. KCP though was a monster for them. He was impacting the game on both ends of the floor. Not only does he knock down four threes for 19 points, but defensively he had like at the end of that third quarter right before Luka came out, he had like three or four plays in a row where it was just like him getting a steal, him tipping a pass, or him blocking a Justin Jackson three-point attempt in the corner. Like He was just flying all over the place. He's having a very good year, and that's the kind of that's the kind of play that we, we need more of. Like We get a, a good flavor of that out of Dorian Finney-Smith, and that's great. I, I 
I will admit, I'm disappointed we're not getting a better level of play out of Justin Jackson. I feel like he's really been fading, and I would say at this point, there's a fairly good chance, obviously, just because of his contract and uh, his still potential, that he could be certainly a piece in some kind of deal we do at the deadline. But uh, again, I'm not sounding panic alarms here. Dallas is still very good on the road. Literally a 3-1 to one ratio in terms of victory versus defeat on the road. 12-4 and four in those situations. They're still 21-11. and 11. I need to check the standings. I didn't update that. I see that now. Let me take a look at the standings here. The updated standings. Yeah, Dallas 5th in the West. So, even then, you're four and a half back. Like, you're not, you're not buried at this point. The Lakers, they had their struggles for a few games. They righted the ship, and now they've looked much better the last two games. Excuse me. And that's pretty much where uh, Dallas finds itself now. Like, they're going to have to weather a little bit of adversity. In their case, it's an unusual adversity because they're about to go to Oklahoma City on Tuesday night, I believe. And then after that, they have like five or six games in a row at home. Like, normally you would say, hey, hey. Awesome. That is that is whew, the basketball gods smiling down on us, giving us a little bit of favor, a little bit of extra advantage for the next you know week and a half or whatever. Nah, nah, not really. Like we've not been good at home. We're nine and seven on the season at home. So we're going to have to fix some things. We're going to have to step some things up a little bit. We're going to have to hope Luca is actually still good and ready to go. And hopefully he's not going to have any ill effects from this fall. He took in the second quarter. He's got a little bit of extra time before the OKC game. Don't sleep on that OKC game, by the way. They are they were seventh in the West, but they just won in Toronto. And they're playing great. They are still seventh at 17 and 15 overall. But Chris Paul is playing very good for them. Shy Gilgis Alexander uh, is is he looks like he's got future star written on him. And there's a lot to look at for that Thunder team. They play really well, so do not sleep on that game. They started off slow this year, but they have rebounded quite nicely. They still look like they could actually be a playoff team, which after the Russell Westbrook and Paul George trades of the summer, I would have told you there's no way in hell that this could be a playoff team. I I would have had them at the bottom of the Western Conference probably just on that assumption alone. But, hey, it's just one more thing for me to eat crow about right now. So... I think that's going to do it for this video, guys. It's one game. Don't get don't get all worked up about it. You know, when you go against the best team in the Western Conference, arguably the best team in the NBA right now, and your worst defeat in this case, you're talking about, what, 13 points? Okay. 13 points on the road on the second night of a back-to-back? I'm not going to be that upset about it, especially when you see, you know, our own offensive struggles. And it's not just what the Lakers did. There were guys getting wide open looks at threes and just not knocking them down. That kind of thing. More often than not, I think works itself out. So adjustments can and will be made. And I am still talking, but I've accidentally hit my animation prematurely. And uh, how silly. (laughs) Anyways, now that I've had an awkward dismount to this, to this podcast, I've been DDP. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and remember, every legend was once a prospect. Now hit that shit! Flawless.